Vision 2030, an economic program to boost growth and to focus on strategic outcomes for the economy. How well is Vision 2030 currently being pursued? Um, I hope I got you correctly. That was a bit faint, but um, I take it your question was how is Vision 2030 currently being fulfilled? Yes. Yes, well, um, as you all know, we are still in the very early stages of a 20-year program. And in the first five-year medium-term medium plan, which is basically the foundational phase where we're going to be setting up all the structures um, in order to ensure delivery of Vision 2030 within a stipulated 20-year time frame by 2030. And I think whereas we had a slow start at the beginning of 2008, if the first year 2008 was a slow start, owing, of course, to the post-election crisis that uh, hit the country at the time, uh, quickly followed by the global financial crisis and the drought. But I think we're quickly getting back on track. All right. Now, the plan is to produce annual growth rates systematically and steadily of 10%. But currently, Kenya's growth is at about 4.9%. Some people would say, you know, it's a bit of an over-ambitious uh, forecast for the future. How do you respond to that? Well, let me just correct you somewhat. Actually, it's, we're not yet at 4.9% yet. We're looking at 4.5% for this year. And the 10% target is um, earmarked for the year 2015. That's five years down the road. And so for me, I think that is absolutely realistic and doable and achievable. We were able to move from a negative growth rate in the year 2002 to 7.1%, uh, which was five year time frame in 2007. So there is absolutely no reason why we can't do it again. And you've got to recall that this time around, we've got a very focused program under Vision 2030 to get us to 10% in the next five years. All right, there is a view that uh, more needs to be done to make Kenya less susceptible to external shocks. And I'll just take you to the uh, global credit crisis, the post-electoral violence, and how that affected a key uh, foreign exchange earning sector such as tourism. Recently, a, a minor issue such as the volcano in Europe affected the horticultural sector of the economy severely. Something needs to be done to buffer the economy. What are those buffers being introduced? Well, let's look at all those um, events that you've spoken about. First, I think we're all working very hard to ensure that the crisis that occurred in 2008 does not recur. And indeed, the political governance reforms we are currently undertaking, um, the most important one of which is, uh, will be the delivery of a new constitution later this year, um, go towards ensuring that we have governance reforms that have everyone in this country feeling that they're participating in a, in a, in a country that caters for them. Um, to prevent the kind of crisis that happened. However, um, you know, the volcano, the global financial crisis, the current Euro, um, um, European uh, debt crisis, all these are uh, external shocks that we have to get accustomed to. I mean, in the long course of 20 years, I fully expect that this economy will have to withstand other shocks that we cannot predict today. So we cannot get too concerned about transient events um, as you've mentioned. However, the key ones, uh, which are, uh, arise out of social instability, those we are addressing very aggressively uh, in what we refer to here in Kenya as Agenda 4 reforms, which have a very specific uh, time frame, which are part of the political pillar vision 2030, and which I can assure you are going on a pace. And, and as I said earlier on, the major one being the delivery of a new constitution. All right, Mr. Kibati, I mean, part of the vision 2030 is about identifying economic zones, developing them, and just, again, as I said, targeting specific out outcomes for tourism, for agriculture, for manufacturing. Now, if you focus on manufacturing, for instance, the sector's been in decline to the extent that it's about 9.5% of GDP. Um, it's largely due to high cost of production, high taxes, and um, importation of uh, cheap goods to compete with local manufacturers. They are crying for help, for stimulus from the government. How does Vision 2030 aim to address some of these deficiencies, aim to empower manufacturers so that we're looking at a more diversified Kenyan economy? Well, let me start by saying that um, we uh, in this part of Africa are quite proud of 
having what I, what I think is the most diversified economy um, in Eastern Central Africa. And you're right. I mean, obviously, we're concerned about manufacturing. It has gone down to 9.5%. Part of it is in absolute terms, but I think also, relatively, other sectors are growing faster. So it isn't always because the manufacturing is declining, but other sectors grow faster. ICT, for instance. However, I want to acknowledge that uh, we have uh, challenges um, in the cost and reliability of energy uh, in this country, uh, which is one of the biggest um, issues facing manufacturing. But we do have, as part of Vision 2030, significant infrastructure projects aimed towards, one, um, addressing um, transport infrastructure, both rail and road, um, also communications, ICT and uh, telecommunications, but very, very importantly, energy generation. We have major projects over the next few years, the next three, four years, to, develop, to bring um, online about 2,000 megawatts, which is twice the current installed capacity of geothermal, uh, and other sources of green energy, which I think should help, uh, should go a long way towards lessening the pressure on manufacturing when it comes to cost of manufacturing. However, all this, of course, is going to be long term. It is important that we do recognize and acknowledge that we have some work to do and some work already is being done on that, in that regard. All right, we have a guest host here, Andrew Duvenage, and I just want to bring him into the conversation. I mean, when a country starts preparing its economic growth outlook on a series of planned outcomes, five-year plans through a vision 2030. Is that the way to go about it? I suppose you've got to break it down into bite-sized chunks. Um, so I think it's probably a good start. Um, I think as Mr. Kabati says quite correctly is diversification is probably the key to it all is not over-reliance on any specific sector. Um, also, I agree with the fact that there will always be exogenous factors that will come into it mm -hmm. that will uh, sort of throw you off your, your path. Um, and so that diversification will be key. Um, fuel dependency is something that was mentioned over there, which I yeah. think will be very important for developing yeah. nations um, not to be held ransom to uh, uh, crazy oil prices prices in the future if they were to arise. Um, and then outside of that, once again, the diversification issue is probably key for them for it to be sustainable. In saying that though, 10% a year for 15 years is a massive number and to, to a large extent that will be reliant on the rest of the, uh, the world in terms of their economy. Mm -hmm. And the one word that I suppose we all have to be worried about when we look at China and India is overheating. Um, you know, that type mm -hmm. of level of growth, um, albeit of a slightly smaller base right. than South Africa, is still a huge number. So some of the countries globally that have grown at rates above 8 to 10% uh, are either resource rich countries, oil producers, or countries that have a very strong manufacturing base, such as the ones in Southeast Asia, and producing huge volumes for export, none of which I think Kenya is. Sure. And, and it remains to be seen because that, that level of growth has not been seen in, in sub-Saharan Africa consistently. So whether it's achievable over a short time period may be the case. Um, as a consistent member without overheating, I suppose questions will be raised off a diversified economy base. Okay, Mr. Kibati, back to you. There is also the issue of urbanization and it's not peculiar to um, Kenya. It's actually a phenomenon all across Africa, the fastest growth rates in terms of urbanization rates. It's expected that within a few years time, two thirds of the population will be living in cities. And when people live in cities, they need housing, they need sanitation, and they need jobs. How does Vision 2030 aim to address that? Well, Again, uh, Vision 2030 is a pretty comprehensive program. Um, and under the economic pillar of Vision 2030, we do aim to deal with the, uh, the issue of jobs to start with. And especially economic zones will be developed to create millions of jobs. And this will be cities. You know, you talk about urbanization. We will have, for the first time, controlled urbanization through special economic zones, which are large integrated cities. Um, which will be master planned very deliberately um, in, with a view to having organized population uh, migrations this time around. Uh, when it comes to, and obviously you talked about uh, sanitation and transportation, when you master plan cities deliberately, then you take care of all that. The Nairobi Metropolitan is the first experiment we're undertaking, and uh, already they have master planned Nairobi, the existing city, in a much more deliberate way and, and, and ensuring that infrastructure construction going forward is holistic as opposed, you know, including sanitation and, and, and stuff like that. Finally, on affordable housing, under the social pillar of Vision 2030, we intend to deliberately look at affordable public housing. And obviously, we'll be benchmarking with countries in the East um, that have been successful in ensuring that 
housing is available uh, in affordable, uh, at affordable rates for most of its urban population. And also, of course, ensuring as well that those populations outside the urban centers are also gainfully employed as well. All right. Uh, staying within this tech infrastructure, we can't escape that issue, not in Kenya, not in South Africa, not in Nigeria, not in any of the leading economies. And those who are critics of Vision 2030 say that so far it's even barely been able to reach its target for a rapid transit system in Nairobi. And they blame issues such as procurement processes that are very slow and also a limited private sector interest. How are you going to get partnerships with indigenous businesses to support the vision, to invest in the vision, and to ensure that you start building on the infrastructure as early as now? Well, I will say it's a bit rich to claim that the vision hasn't succeeded on rapid transit infrastructure because we've only started thinking through that. Um, well, well, I'll admit that there's been failure in the past, prior to Vision 2030 being mooted, was that Transport, uh, transport infrastructure within Nairobi wasn't deliberately planned. Now we're going through a process of thinking through deliberately, uh, master planning, uh, transport, uh, an integrated national transport policy, including Nairobi, which integrated in the sense that it looks at all forms of transport, including uh, pedestrian traffic, uh, uh, motorcycle traffic, vehicle, vehicular traffic of all sorts, buses and small cars, as well as metro and uh, commuter rails. And so once that is done, and we hope to complete this exercise by the end of this year, while concurrently beginning to develop commuter rail transportation to decongest Nairobi, we can then talk about, um, starting from next year, um, implementing the integrated national transport master plan for the entire country of, with a focus, of course, on Nairobi.